After me, no sudden movements, please. You approach a nice looking building that houses a two story gallery called the Art Hall. Two large men in suits flank the door on both sides and they give your companion a nod as you approach. Prompted by the strangers guiding you, you walk inside. The gallery is full, which is unusual at this hour, to say the least. About two dozen faces fill the showroom, and a number of waiters navigate the gathering, serving drinks. All of them are beneath the guests' attention. The visitors are well dressed for the most part, but it's clear, unclear, what they have gathered here for. Nobody seems to be particularly interested in the art pieces on the walls, and the atmosphere is polite, and naturally so. Many guests turn to look at you and the stranger who brought you here. Their glances are varied. You see open contempt on a few faces and animated interest on others. Most of the eyes in the room call me observe you as if wishing to appraise your worth. The last time you felt like this was at your previous job interview. It was like being a piece of li livestock, inspected from all sides for any imperfection, so your wage could be haggled down. It was dehumanizing and made you feel dirty. When they called you the next day to offer you the job, you declined. Even when you are nobody, you become even less if you trade away your dignity for a paycheck. The memory makes you feel warmer inside even now, although the state of your bank account never did. Good evening, Gadir, and to you, child. The noble, cold voice takes you out of your head and back to the situation at hand. The gallery, a crowd of strangers, you being brought here against your will. For what purpose? The room awaits your response. Not a child. Who are you calling a child? The Prince of New York, Helene Panhard, child of Michaela, is addressing you, whelp. You will show respect. My serf, this harshness is unnecessary. This fledgling clearly does not grasp the finer points of our Argo. She is somewhat plain looking and doesn't seem to possess a great deal of charm. But still, the entire room is intently focused on her voice. She has influence over these people. That much is clear. You may address me as Prince Child. I realize your introduction into Unlife was abrupt, and I understand your sire left shortly after. The rules of our society dictate I punish you both for this transgression. A murmur of agreement, maybe, can be heard from the gathered audience. But I am willing to listen to what our loyal sheriff has to say about the circumstances of your embrace first. Punish me? Are you serious? For what exactly? The sins of the father, so to speak. We have certain rules. One of them is that it's unlawful to create progeny without the prince's approval. My approval. 
Your sire never bought father to ask for it. You are about to be judged by the court of New York City, Cordier. Please tell us how you found this fletchling and what happened on your way here. Court, Prince, is this some kind of secret society make-believe? A trusted informant who has chosen to remain anonymous at this time tipped me off about a suspicious kindred appearing in one of our domains. Upon investigating, I found them gone, but this fledgling remained in their place. The hunger made him savage a prostitute and his client in a Bronx brothel. Belonging to one of the ministry, I have already spoken to Sansarik about this and makes, made sure it will blow over. The fledgling proved to have quite the nerve and an unruly tongue. Surprisingly enough, he offered little resistance last night and cooperated on our way to the safe house. I was pleased to not have to force his compliance. We had a quick chat, but wishing to appear here post haste, I urged him to join me, which he did without struggle. Again, a pleasant departure from my usual routine. His first partially slaked with the packed blood we kept in the safe house, we had a pleasant enough drive here. The story ends with us arriving at Elysium tonight. All eyes are on you again. You take a special interest in one of the faces. It's a beautiful woman with curly, almost blood red hair and a dress to match. You see her whispering to some bespectacled man with an absent minded look on his face. Who is she, you wonder? Thank you, Gadir. I take note of this fledgling's behavior and will take it into consideration later. She turns her attention to you. First, there is the matter of your sire. The person who brought you where Kadir picked you up from last night. Who were they? A Latina woman. Very radical, unless she convincingly lied to me. She was special, extraordinary. She had fire, conviction, temper. She seduced me, easily in fact. Made me think she wanted me. I fell for it, and now I'm here. It feels awkward talking to a room full of strangers about what seemed like a random one-night stand at the time. Not to mention that even though the Latina made an impression on you for sure, her face is already fading from your mind. You realize she never even told you her name. Well, Gadia, does that sound familiar? No, it does not, or at least not familiar enough. I will continue the search after we're done here. I told you what I know. Can I go now? No, definitely not. What shall I do with the fledgling, my prince? What is your recommendation, my sheriff? The traditions are clear. Thou shall only sire a natter with the permission of thine elder. If thou createst a natter without thine elder's leave, both thou and thy progeny shall be slain. I am ready to fulfill my duty. Stay your hand for just a moment longer, Gadir. I wish to consult my counsel on this. Make sure everyone is in agreement. Of course. He seems strangely relieved. 
The prince leaves the main showroom and a handful of people follow her out. You're about to ask this Godia what all that talk of traditions and councils was. When the red-haired woman approaches the two of you. Sophie. Sheriff, I was wondering if I could have a word with the fledgling. What for? She lowers her voice in response. Come now, Kadir, we all know what the word it is going to be. Let me speak to them. You might not have to stay in your hands tonight, after all. Her words grab his attention. His face is hard to read. It's like several emotions are struggling for domination. Anger, sadness, hope, gratitude, resolve. I'll go get my sword. He steps out of the room the way you came, and you are left in the showroom with the woman in the red dress. She takes you aside, and the eyes of the remaining guests follow you. Well then, fledgling, you are in quite a pickle. Wait, did I hear it right? What did he say about the sword? Your hearing isn't faulty. We only have a short while before the prince hears her counsel out and Gudea he returns here with his blade. So listen, please. Last night you became a vampire. Wait, what? Oh yes, I'm well aware of how ridiculous that sounds. It's the reason why we have these nicer words for it, kindred. Being appraised, having a sire, the fact remains. The beings called vampires, you're looking at them, they're us. You glance around, some of the guests are still occasionally looking at you, commenting on you in hushed tones. Many of the patrons are pale, really pale. Most hold glasses of wine. No, not wine, that's not the right thickness, and not the right color either. either. You're trying to come up with something sensible to say, but you're drawing a blank. It makes a morbid kind of sense, you drank blood last night. There's no denying it, and your breathing has not returned. Your heart remains still. A vampire.